I like the isolation. I love, I'm not a, the kind of artist who works with a lot of people or brings a lot of people into my work. I really like being in this room uh, by myself. Have you always been that way or has it been always. Like that No, I've always been that way. I've always been like, I guess in my work, I get into my world in my work and then my, my surroundings are real important to me because I put all of my things up around me and uh, it just becomes a very uh, personal, specific environment. I don't really bring a lot of people into my studio. Of course, I'm bringing the world in now, <laughs> which is not uh, you know, something I normally do. I once drew my fantasy studio up um, of what I thought my ideal studio would be, and uh, it, it isn't as good as this studio. I never expected to ever have a studio like this. Maybe it's the kind of inner sanctum or the, you know, Dory, the holy of holies or something, but it's sort of my space to I maybe feel confident and free enough to really revel in the, the stuff that I'm interested in. To really, I call it working without breaks. Um, in a way, if you can get enough trust and confidence in yourself that you're, you don't censor your images, you don't analyze too closely your images, but you let them come out, you let them happen. And I always say it's great because you don't break any bones with it unless I fall off a ladder. So in a funny way, it's a safe way to take great risks and get great rewards uh, in a way. I was roller skating as a kid over in Prospect Park and I had on this old metal roller skates, the clamps. I remember this day vividly and there was this one hill over there that was a pretty steep hill and I would always either uh, sit down and go down it or I would walk down the grass or take my shoes, take my skates off or I could never, this hill was too much. And one day uh, I was at, I was kind of flirting around the edge of it and I went, I went over. Before I knew it I was going down the hill at unbelievable speed on these skates. And I think I sort of wanted to, I don't know, I must have wanted to. And I just remember that feeling of like extreme uh, uh, excitement and fear, that combination. And a lot of my work is about opposites, about real funny things and very dark things. So I really liked that, that feeling of fear and, uh, and, and uh, excitement. And this doesn't happen all the time, but once in a while, maybe when you're towards the end of a piece or in, a, in, a, in the part of a piece when things are really clicking, you get that kind of like, whoa, <laughs> you just get that, whoa, this is clicking. It's, it's like uh, the endorphins, the art endorphins are all kicking in. And you just feel, you can't really, it's hard, that's the closest I can come to describing it. And I got down the hill okay, and then when I got down the hill, I looked back up at it, and it was all pavement, and there were big cracks in it that I had managed to negotiate somehow. And you sort of don't know how you did it. People say that they recognize my work immediately, but it's probably because it's, uh, it's very traditional and very <laughs> conservative. <laughs> It is frustrating from the sense that people don't recognize design as a profession. People don't understand what you do. Even I don't even think my mom knows what I do uh, when I tell her, uh, what, you know, I did this poster. She says, well, did you take the pictures? And I say, no. Did you write the copy? No. Uh, did you set the type? Actually, I didn't even do that. The designer is the person who plans all of these uh, things and serves as a facilitator and a director. The requirements uh, of, for a person who intends to enter the field as a professional are very rigorous. A designer has to wear a lot of different hats and you need a, I think, a, uh, a broad ranging uh, background. I think a university experience is very good for people. Uh, it is often said that those who can't do it, can't cut it professionally, end up going into teaching. I don't feel that way. I think you ought to be able to to do what professionally what you're what you're teaching. But there are, there are things that you can teach. Uh, the process, uh, the history, the traditions, the vocabulary. Uh, that's what we try to teach in our program. And we start 
with a program that is uh, more theoretical and progressively through the curriculum it becomes more and more applied and so I push people to find out what it is they want to do what they're really aiming toward and uh, uh, coach them as well as you can to get there to be as good as, at it as they can be. The intensity of the students here is really quite remarkable and I think perhaps it has something to do with that Midwestern work ethic. And we've had many students who have come from the farm, you know, as a lot of artists do. I was raised on a farm, so I have this landscape imagery ingrained in me because you were always looking at the horizon line. And always conscious of the changes of the horizon as the wind blew and it was the wheat field and, and changing light and changing color as uh, it was from green to the browns. I loved the natural uh, conchoidal fractures because when you looked through the stone, it looked as though you were w looking into a frozen pond and these forms swirling about underneath the grass forms, the rocks, and that kind of translucence of ice. The the difference in finishing a piece well is that the, the design really comes off so that you don't notice the craftsmanship at all. It should be so, it should be good enough that you don't notice it, that you really notice, wow, what a beautiful form, or what a, you know, gorgeous image, or what does this mean, or, you know, whatever the artist is trying to portray in the piece rather than, oh my God, how many solder scenes are in that? You should just not think about that at all, or the viewer shouldn't have to. And, uh, it's interesting when the students, especially as they become more advanced, understand that and realize that the thing that really marks our students apart from many others, even you know, in other metals people and other programs, is the sense of craftsmanship. Working big like this is a hassle because it's heavy. What do you do with it when you finish it? Nobody will buy a piece this big. Uh, they're even hard to give away. Uh, but you, I still have to make them. I've got a whole studio in the back just heaped full of these things. Um, so I make the little ones that are, people have walls big enough to, to house them. And uh, that kind of gives me enough income to make some more of the big ones. So that's. That's kind of the, but I enjoy making these pieces. People enjoy seeing them, and uh, someday maybe I'll even find someone to buy them, so I don't know. But that doesn't stop me. Now I need some color. I've always used bright colors, and I always kind of use colors right out of the can. Uh, in other words, I never, I don't mix the colors that much. They get mixed maybe on the piece or in the, in the piece, but uh, essentially my palette is a bright one. I, I like bright colors, and a lot of times I've worked in the dark so that I didn't know what the colors were until I brought them out into a light situation. <laughs> so I'm, a, I like to be surprised by my work too. I mean, I don't like to, you know, if I was totally in control of what I'm doing, then I would be bored by it. I, I like the fact that uh, there are surprises. I had the opportunity to either live in New York or live in, in California and be an artist in either one of those situations. And uh, I mean, I spent time in both places and I decided that I knew that if I wanted to be 
you've got to be where the where the art's happening. I mean, that's why artists traditionally have gone to Paris or to uh, Rome or to uh, Milan or to New York or wherever it's happening to be, you know, in the center of it because that's where the energy is. That's where everything happens. But you know. Being here, I'm, I've accepted the fact that I'm not going to ever be the, you know, way on the top. Very few people from the, in the sticks make it. I guess I would probably like to have more big, fancy New York shows, but I'm not willing to work for it, you know. I'm not willing to, to go to New York and uh, give up, my, you know, my environment right here. Uh, Self-expression has never really interested me. Uh, myself expressing certain ideas does interest me because as a human being, you know, I'm six feet two, I look a little different, air comes into me one way, images flow in, sounds flow in, I feel sensations, and I want to take all of that in and somehow to let what it is me to express certain ideas based on all of that. But I have no interest in expressing myself. I mean. Well, it just wouldn't seem very important. Um, a lot of artists disagree, but I think it's important that I do something that I can do in 1994 uh, that uh, someone would look at and would guess that it wasn't done in 1750. Uh, I just think that's kind of important that um, we respond to what's going on around us. My grandfather never traveled on an interstate, didn't have a jet airplane, didn't play Super Nintendo, didn't read the journal Leonardo, didn't look at Robert Rauschenberg's work. Now, how does all of that stuff feed into me as an artist and say, if, if as an artist one is sensitive, how does that then come out in terms of expressive form, in terms of not only thinking but feeling? And that really concerns me, that somehow my work uh, is coming from me or a person that is, say, living uh, in the culture. And so I started re-examining my own practice that, well, I live 22 hours a day like this, and for two hours a day, I enter those other channels. And I'm just trying to realign those, that the things I utilize and really mean a lot to me, and it seems to the culture as a whole, that I try to start dealing more intensely with, with those. High art has a lot to offer us, but uh, there are problems, I think, when fine art or precious art enters into a capital-intensive, commodity-driven economy and culture. And again, that kind of economy is historically, say, different than what existed 200 years ago. So what I see is that we have a technology, interactive multimedia, interactive computer-mediated work, that is not pushing us way out ahead of where we were once in history, but it's bringing us to a circle. It's letting us recoup some of the powers of calligraphy, where form and content merge, to recoup the notion of having image and sound together, and movement and stillness together. The other issue that this work deals with that will continue is, of course, interaction. Um, that to make a work that the viewer simply can't mentally contemplate. Well, the viewer can, but it doesn't make sense. That the viewer needs to be physically active. And through that engagement is to force a point not so much about particular aspects of the work, but particular aspects of the way we interact or the way we deal with art, the way we receive it. And I guess the metaphor is, is a metaphor, in a sense, for life, you know. Uh, life gets better the more we engage it. And Realist painters are attracted to a figure or a landscape. I mean, these are very recognizable things. I mean, still life is, a, is another genre. I think a, a lot of that, in my case, it has to do with an, an ordering of the environment, mainly one's own environment. Like in, in the figure paintings, um, they were mainly about people that I knew, relationships. There's always a psychological connection. And with the landscape, there's always, it's not so much a psychological connection as I feel a spiritual connection. Realists often get asked this question, why not just take a photograph? Um, 
because the the real thing is better the experience you know the, the, I enjoy painting you know I, I'm basically a painter at heart I love paint I love the smell of paint I love the feel of paint I love the whole process I think about the work in that I want it to communicate the feeling that um, I'm experiencing or have experienced as the, actually they're, they're sort of records they're visual records for me and I want them to be true to, to the way I feel about the place or the person. And if a, a viewer senses that, if that gets communicated, then I find it successful. And sometimes it doesn't always get communicated. It, it's, I don't find that a problem is if it doesn't communicate to the viewer. If it doesn't communicate for me, you know, if it doesn't capture that feeling, then I find it's a problem. The pain is not successful. And I think um, some paintings are more successful than others, and there's a time period where, okay, th that issue or that place is no longer so important to me that I really have to capture it, and I let it go and go on to the next painting. If I'm stuck for designs, I'll take paper or metal and just twist it or cut into it, you know, and somehow get my hands on it because for me it's a very tactile uh, sense of expression. You know, I need to have the material in my hands to work with it. metal that was melted in the uh, ceramic crucible has now jumped through that crucible into the mold over here. And if you want to zero in, I'll show you how you, uh, you get the castings out. This mold material is very much like plaster Paris, and it'll disintegrate when the, uh, when the cold water hits it. And you can just see inside uh, how the pins are set up. So. I, I uh, tend to stay with very simple shapes and, um, and try to um, not to embellish the form by adding things to it. Like I don't put a lot of stuff on the surface. But what I do is I, I, I uh, twist the metal, I force the metal so that the decoration or the dec not the dec but the decorative quality is the form of the piece. You know, instead of adding decoration to it by sticking things on it. Uh, the form is the, has the decorative quality inherent in it. Like this is, this wine cup has a, the one? yeah, this has a Jewish star that's built right into the cup, and you can't see that from the outside, but when you, you put the wine in it, for instance, it takes the shape of the star, the Star of David, you know, so, and the, most of the cups I make are like that. There's a whole series of different ones that have different styles of folded um, star forms for this, so that I'm not, putting Hebrew letters on this or anything else because the form is the object. The same thing like the creamer over there. I made that for my wife. I asked her if she wanted something for the house and she said, yeah, she'd like a creamer. So I sat down and made the creamer. It's not, the piece is unpretentious, which is what I like about it. I think it's a, it's a more oriental view uh, where you don't try to make a knock them dead pot, you know, that's gonna just be extremely striking. You try to make something subtle uh, and, uh, and unpretentious and usable that gives the viewer or the handler or the user uh, just a very nice tactile and aesthetic feel, which is what my pots are all about. The image exists uh, perhaps is created by the unconscious or maybe is in the unconscious and it comes out through drawing and um, I put it together. Why are you smiling? Well, <laughs> in the sense that um, uh, I, like, I like the content to be um, maybe a little, little unnerving. unnerving. <laughs> Wisconsin? 
Yeah, this is um, this is the Wisconsin um, landscape. So I had this this image there, and I was thinking, yeah, televangelist, and then um, you know the kind of baptism by water, and then as it developed, the uh, televangelist started looking like Hitler. It's all rather Wagnerian. <laughs> I want the uh, viewer to be somewhat captivated by it, intrigued. I want to look at it for a while. And I figure if I want to look at it for a while, then uh, my experience has been uh, other spectators will also. The artist's role, <laughs> it's a little pompous, but is not to present a message to, uh, to the viewing audience, but to, to, to um, uh, uh, present an image that will encourage some kind of participation on the part of the viewer. Is it painstaking? Well, yeah, you could call it painstaking. I hate that term painstaking because it, um, uh, it implies that uh, you're not uh, really doing anything significant. You're, you're, you're being painstaking. You know, oh, isn't that careful? Or isn't that, oh, wow. Um, Gee how, long it you know, gee, how long did it take you to do that? And Gee, how, this is, it's one of the problems with etching. Everybody gets wrapped up in the process. The painting is different. You know, put a mark down, you know, don't like that mark. It's, it's a constant, uh, constant dialogue, constant interaction. There's a relationship between the two that in both compositions, sort of at center of the composition is a uh, raving lunatic. And I don't know quite what to make of that. So. For, uh, so, there, so there is some continuity here. Uh, don't ask me what that all means. All right, what, I, what I started doing um, of late, and this is just this one particular piece, this one structure, is one of the uh, the better attempts at it and the past three or four or five attempts that I've made in the past year since I've been up here is that I'm taking some of these same photographs that I've collected over the years and putting them into this kind of uh, assemblage, which this particular piece is simply, it, it's set up to look like a, an altar piece. But the picture in the middle is a is a, got an, an image of, well, it's an image of my brother but it's an image of him sitting writing letters home and there's an M60 machine gun in the foreground. I'd started college right out of high school and then my brother came home from Vietnam and, uh, and this is his, after his first tour. He was 15 months older than me and we started partying a lot when he got back and we did an awful lot of other things uh, and it's, it wound up taking me away from being interested in school for the most part and I started doing an awful lot of other stuff. I was I was living in Cape Cod for a while, and, and I was really just a 19-year-old, 18, 19-year-old, enjoying life. And, and even though Vietnam was going on all around me, I wasn't part of the scene of a lot of people in the late 60s where I was very mentally educated. I was only touching it briefly. My brother was in Nam, but he and I, we never, the only things we ever dealt with were kind of casual. I mean, we dealt with very close friendships, and very, you know, he taught me everything, but but we never, we never dealt with any serious, serious things about what's life all about. I think after I came back, realizing I was gonna get drafted, and I joined, and I was in boot camp at 19 when uh, the word came back that he was killed. So that was a major trauma for me at 19. And I think then it started making me look back at life, at uh, what I was taught, and what, what the patriotism, that I was handed as, as a kid growing up and the belief in the country and I started doing a lot more reading and it started changing my philosophies of life, my moral ideologies, I started structuring them. Not, not like I'm beating things to a pulp and really trying to understand them, but it did make a big difference as, as to what this life was all about and what kind of choices I had made and were they really my choices. And I started re-examining all of my history over a slow period of time of dealing with philosophies and stuff and realizing that an awful lot of the choices that I had made throughout my life were made because I was conditioned to make those choices. The people that come to the exhibit make the piece. I'm just sort of setting this, this very minimal framework where 
where the people come and talk and, and have discussions and, and interact with these pieces. I don't really buy into that sort of, there's a few geniuses out there or whatever. I guess a lot of my um, thinking is that, that artists aren't so different from everyone else and I think there's a lot of very creative people in our society. This is called Assumed Guilty. It's about that feeling of being looked at and, being, and people assuming something about you. It's kind of like you come to see an art show, but you're, you end up being the art, the exhibit. You end up being on exhibit. A, a big point of mine is making, making this stuff so that, it, that it's fun to, to go and interact with it and that maybe, maybe you'll think about it afterwards even if you don't think of it. The time sort of, why did I do that? Why was that art? I think too often art is very distant from our society and, and, from, and we're afraid of it. We're afraid to, to say what we think about something and I think a lot of people that aren't in the art world are very afraid of what they might think about a painting or, or a piece of sculpture or a performance piece. They're, people don't really trust their instincts about that. I really believe that art should be something that, that you enjoy doing and that you should figure out the materials you like working with and the processes you like um, and the ideas you like working with um, and that you, that you should have fun doing it. I think that that's the only way you're going to keep doing it. In 1985, uh, I became uh, chairman of the department, and um, um, it's it's a it's a full-time job, basically what it is. And I um, uh, made a habit of accepting all the uh, invitations that were tendered me to um, be in exhibitions, so that I would keep working. And when I started working. The stuff was so awful that um, I thought, um, and it was a whole bunch of stuff. It wasn't just one or two pieces. It was everything I did was just awful. So I uh, sort of thought, God, I've lost it. I, uh, I might, maybe I better look around for another administration job or something like that. And what was happening is that everything was just sort of turning to flat, two-dimensional mud. And, uh, and, and I couldn't figure out how to, um, to establish the, the kind of give and go and push and pull and all that stuff that I've been involved with most of my life as a painter. And uh, so my solution was to introduce some structure, some architecture, some geometry, if whatever, in, in this work. And then uh, my thought was uh, the um, color will then conform to these things and will therefore be spatial. And then these things are going to disappear and the color is going to come back. Well, as it turns out, the things didn't disappear. They're, they're the kinds of things I'm interested in now and uh, the, the whole business of, of uh, the, where the boxes uh, or where the shapes sit in space and, and how they relate one to another and, and how they, they seem to be in a somewhat logical uh, spatial progression, but in reality there's a multi-layered -layer, um, spatial progressions going on in the work. There's a difficult balance between art art education and education. And my students have to balance all three of those. Someone in art education seeks to make art. They want to 
be successful educators in terms of a very broad sense. They, they want to uh, prepare people and educate. But then we also have art education that uh, is trying to define how the role of the artist, the individual, and the art world and society all come together. The world certainly is not static and neither should be education. If I'm not pleased with how the adult population is responding to art, over a 10, 15, 20 year career, you're the person that developed that. <laughs> and so you're gonna have to be the person that lives with that now. I mean, those are the people that are supporting in a lukewarm way or not at all, or they're supporting you wholeheartedly in a community and going to bat for you. Uh, so uh, I think people start realizing that it just isn't what they're doing day to day. It's what I'm doing through the year that makes connections with students. It, uh, connects with students over a great period of time. You know, how many students come back and say, you know, this is what I'm involved with now. Thanks for teaching me about this in art. I think there's a physicality to all the work that I do. The process that I'm doing now is a very quick process uh, in, in, the, in the way that you can lay, you lay down powders and cane and you pour over it and, uh, you know, I mean, you, can, you set up molds, but it's a very quick process. I like to be surprised at what happens uh, and that gives me energy back. I'm always trying to find a function for, for work in some way or another. Uh, if, if the work doesn't have a function, um, uh, kind of literally, I mean, uh, I, I, I want it to have one um, spiritually, metaphorically, politically, whatever. But um, so the personal work is, um, uh, it really, my work really comes just out of my own um, sensibilities. Part of what I work into, uh, a lot of my work is uh, is chance. You know, is that is that feeling of uh, spontaneity. <laughs> Trying to define what it is that my work is is not my, it's not my intention, you know. My intention is to make things that have meaning to me and hopefully have meaning to other people. That's as deep as it gets. <laughs> and and to, to try to define where that fits in to other places, I mean, um, that has no relevance to me. It, it, it doesn't mean anything. You know, I mean, that's for other people um, if they have the time to figure out.
I, I'm part Native American, it's part, and uh, my grandmother was, uh, on my mother's side was full blood, and uh, one of the first things I remember, when I was about two and a half, three years old, she took me out into the woods and had me hold on to a tree while she left, and she would not come back until I knew the name of that tree, the tree's name, not the scientific one, but the name of the individual tree. And so um, what I learned was that you, if you allow the knowledge that you have built into you to come to the fore, then there's a rightness to the work. Is this your vision, you think, or is this a, a kind of a broader cultural vision? Of it's an intuitive vision, as I've talked about. Uh, it's partially mine. It's partially the things I don't do well, as well as the things maybe I do well that I don't even know I'm doing well. So it's a combination of things. Hopefully, it's more than a, um, a thing for over the couch. Hopefully, it has some significance to an individual who's caught in a, so a, a social situation that is not as nice as they would like. They're, they're images that have to do with owls and other uh, animal images that are then placed. If you look, if you look in here, you'll see feathers, feather shapes. You'll see uh, a kind of. Um, shield, and you'll also see the dreams of a people, hopefully, if I'm doing it well. So that they're more than the culture I came from. They're more than Western culture. They're an attempt to visualize for a whole other individual a way of seeing beyond themselves. I've always felt that I have this vision, not a mastery, but just a vision that uh, allows me to break new ground. My freedom's uh, always been defined since childhood as a translation, a reinterpretation. So if I say I'm looking at the landscape, what I'm really doing is borrowing from what I see rather than a landscape tradition. And I contemplate this each time I start a work, to what degree I'll borrow from a historical model, and to what degree just me. I'm in it. Uh, my work is, uh, I'm happy with my work now. It's, uh, it's not at the closing, but perhaps at the beginning of new envisionments, new product. I'm uh, moving in like a camera to, uh, close focus and then wide angle focus. The desirable effect is to show contrast rather than incongruity, but contrast in the sense that uh, the cinema can influence also an artist's perception because the camera can do so much besides just reveal honesty. It can show those ambiguities and show those energies in a sense of theme and perception. So I look upon nature now with the freedom of inventing space because I've looked at it with such a acuity of focus. I spend a lot of time with students and I don't talk down to them and I don't talk over them. Painting is a joy. Painting is good food, it's comfortable shoes, it's not about facing this problem and anguishing for the rest of the semester. What I get across is that their particular dream-like influence and their particular focus intellectually is uh, their own responsibility. And so they're developing a strong trust in their individuality. 
Basically, I find myself in the position of always kind of crossing borders. Uh, the work I do, I consider it sculpture. Uh, some people consider it craft because I'm dealing with uh, paper. Um, it gets tough on those kinds of arts board grant forms to figure out which category I should apply for, uh, what are people going to perceive my work as. I really believe as art is something everybody can do. I don't really see myself as teaching to 2% of the class that are going to become professional artists and the rest of the people probably are going to have art be someplace in their life, but it's not, they're going to have a job doing something else. Um, I don't discount that. I, I believe that that's significant and valuable and that art is something, uh, creative work is something that is significant for everybody to be doing. Um, that art provides this contact uh, with a creative world, with the creative process that feeds people, that, that provides for a connection with their deeper energies that is uh, crucial and essential for a balanced and full feeling life. Um, and that simply seeing art as solely the province of people that are selling work in galleries in New York City um, seems to me a kind of limiting view. My piece for the faculty show is called Souvenirs, and what it is is a fake souvenir store. And they're intended to remind people of the kinds of things that they collect, uh, the kinds of things that they use to trigger their memories, that they, they encase their experiences in, that they, they, they purchase at a place and carry home to remember from their trip. I'm hoping that this piece will push people a little bit to think a little bit more about those kinds of objects that they carry their memory in, or the kind of memories that they choose to keep, or uh, the kind of images that that record their experiences, that, that keep them in their memory. Um, there's many different complicated levels of how a viewer could respond to the piece, and I don't think um, everybody is going to get every level, and everybody is going to respond in the same way. I would hope not. Um, and, but I hope it pushes people a little bit. That would be my intention. I've been working in this direction for over 30 years, since 1962. I've always worked mainly with ethnic and minority groups or people that are socially, culturally, financially isolated from the mainstream, which is actually part of a group of people that I can, my origins are myself. Photography's visual anthropology. Maria, the mountain. And the photographs are our historical Bobby record. There home. are very few visual historical Bobby records Sunday. of rural Hispanic people. The people I photographed in Manzano have been up. in Manzano since uh, 1610. Led the I was there for three years photographing off and on. I was there whenever I could be, you know, and uh, so I actually lived in the village. And an important thing about what, one of my, and my role became that of the picture man, El Hombre Retrata, the, the man who makes the pictures. And when I would come into the village, I'd say, the picture man is here, the picture man is here. Maria. Iconography, religious iconography, in their lives was a leading factor, which you see in the photographs. And I try to match the woman behind the ironing board with the, uh, the Blessed Mother on the TV, with a picture on the wall. So they're all uh, compositionally set up, but in the composition also has a content. It's not just for the balance of things, it's, it's both for a, a visual balance, cultural val balance, and a religious balance. In other words, everything has a reason for being there. And that I'm I'm a picture maker, not a picture taker. There's a big difference. In other words, uh, when the people, when I begin to work, I would move things around. They're not as they were. The, mountain. the next stage I'll be doing, I'll be photographing more. I'll be actually photographing four generations of one family. So I've made a commitment of, of 30 years of work. You know, or, or it will be 30 years of work off and on, you know, working with a group of people in an area. Nobody's ever done that before, of, of rural people, you know, people that have been on that land for over 300 years. Actually, it's a love story in a sense, you know, uh, between myself and people in the villages. On the road to Torio.
I've just completed my fifth year. I was just tenured this year, so it was a very exciting year. Uh, prior to this, I was in business. And uh, I spent about 27, eight years as a designer. I began at Container Corporation of America. From there, I went to uh, Unimark International, which at the time was the world's largest, greatest design company. Almost all of these students who go out uh, to be professional designers will be working with business people. And so I try to get them to learn a little bit about business. I try to teach these people how to make a living being a visual communicator. And that is not, has nothing to do with art. They're not expressing themselves at all. They're expressing the wishes and the ideas of their client. Uh, when I first arrived here, my first uh, couple of, my first year, I had very few students who were going to be designers. I had art students who were taking another three hours or something just to expand themselves. Something happened. My second year here, we all of a sudden we were inundated with students who wanted to be graphic designers. I, I can show you some of the work that they do. The Small Business Development Center uh, was our first client, and this is what the students, group of students, uh, did for them. I don't teach students to do things like I did. I made a lot of mistakes, and I would, would rather they not make those same mistakes. I knew nothing about business. And I, I was made a director of a, of a department of 85 people, half of them in Europe. I didn't know what a, uh, a, a department budget was. I was a terrible manager. And I would hate to see other students get into that, you know, in later life, get into that position as I did. So I think one way around it is to learn, learn about business because you are a business person, you're not an artist. I really think something can be um, ugly, but if it meets that client's objective, it's successful design. My main medium has always been prints, specifically uh, etchings. And uh, as you can see by looking around my studio, um, my medium has expanded and changed. And the series that I have, I have a few examples of here. It's, uh, the title is A Consideration of the Phenomenon of Ecstasy. Um, it has in total 45 pieces, and it just grew on its own. There was not a plan of what medium I was going to use or how many parts there were, there were going to be or how they were finally going to be presented. Ultimately, making art is about art. And I think that in my work, people confuse it sometimes and, uh, and think that I'm doing art about religion or just historic work about St. Teresa. It's not about religion. It's about a particular person, and uh, if she doesn't, it wouldn't appear in a nun's garb, um, uh, probably we wouldn't have this association. But really, it's to me, um, it was it was something that that got my juices flowing, that that made me um, do things like marble this paper, uh, uh, sort of blue green, and arrange the leaves around the edge because aesthetically it looked so good to me. So I'm, I'm dealing with the idea is extremely important, but how I present it and how I make it is equally important. As you can see in my work, there, there's a kind of sort of, um, uh, well, a kind of perfection about some of it, I hope. It's, um, there's a kind of reduction. I work in a reductive way, starting out with lots of things and lots of ideas and then and then making that um, eliminating. I think that's, that's a key to how I work as I, I begin to eliminate. But I feel it's very important that these things are as wonderful aesthetically as I can make them, that they, they, they come across visually as something you really want to look at and, and that give, you, um, uh, give your eye some delight. Maybe delight's not the right word, not always delight, maybe shock, maybe. I got such an interesting comment in a gallery in Chicago when I showed this work there that uh, a woman said to me, you're so brave doing religious art. And uh, so I thought, well, that's interesting um, that she appreciates it that way. And then other people have said it's very spiritual work. And then other people have said it's very feminist work. And uh, so I don't have control anymore. So I had better make decisions that I'm happy with. Uh, and 
One can't predict the possibilities, but I'm not unhappy with, with any of those, really. I, I have my intentions, and when someone does understand them, I am really delighted to, to pick up just the nuance that I meant with a piece. I feel very fortunate to have been raised in Mexico. Uh, I'm the third generation who's crossed the border. My grandfather moved to the United States, my father went to Mexico, and I'm, I've come back. Uh, I think about that a lot as to why my work, in my work, I don't try to bring that out more. But then again, I get involved with the book structure. I, get, I fall in love with the text. I fall in love with the typeface. And then the book sort of comes out from the inside and not so much trying to show who I am. So there are other times within my artwork that I give myself uh, the opportunity to go discover something completely foreign to myself. Um, I, I admire artists who can, you know, pull from with their cultural experiences to be the primary motivator for their artwork. But mine, my primary motivator has to do more with uh, discovering new structures for books. The idea for the book structure generally comes from within the content somehow. A, a book that's in progress is by a, a poet who used to live in Illinois called Todd Moore. And it is his account of a battle of, in the Civil War. And some of the things that come to mind from that or some of the sounds and how can I reproduce some of the sounds of some of the materials. Obviously the, the, the Civil War poem is a very graphic, violent one and so some of the, in the making of the handmade paper there are some splatters of red which very you know, simply symbolize the blood from, from the war. But there are more subtle things in terms of what does, what, what do, how do raindrops look when they, when they hit, you know, dusty ground. And, and we've used that idea in making of some of the handmade paper. So sometimes, you know, in, in, in trying to make a book structure or picking materials for the book, you may look at very obvious things as the graphic, violent nature and, and blood and, 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 and symbolizing that with red splatters on paper. Other, otherwise, there, other times there may be very subtle things like raindrops hitting the ground or very subtle sounds and I think that's one thing that we don't take a lot of time to think about. What is the sound of this sheet going to sound like when you turn the page? I have to say that the most enjoyable part is the, is, is the making of them, trying to figure it all out. Once you finish them, they really are like, it's like something that's in the past. Uh, for me, bringing them out to show as after they're done is less interesting to me than to talk to other other people who work within this in this world the the, the book world uh, I would rather talk to them about the projects that I'm working on versus showing the ones that I've done something like lithography in respect to how it fits into the program, uh, it is a very isolated kind of process. And I see it only as, uh, say, an instrument and in, uh, say, the stu student's orchestra. Printmakers get together to talk about how they're basically second-class citizens in the art field. And uh, yet every, practically every major artist in the last 200 years has done prints and done some wonderful ones. My influences uh, initially when I was in art school were other printmakers because I think when you come out of, or when you're in art school, the process of printmaking provides uh, techniques that are really quite unusual and rare and uh, very dramatic for somebody who just does painting and drawing. Once I got going, uh, my interest sort of waned more toward artists that uh, I respected more in a broader sense, meaning uh, I started to look more at uh, painters and sculptors 
rather than uh, printmakers for ideas. I always think that artists go through cycles of different ideas. And to me, this machinery thing uh, was one cycle. And uh, this, with, uh, this print here was sort of the beginning of another, which was based on a more, and a more of a kind of abstraction that uh, dealt with, again, very uh, minuscule sort of objects, flicks of marks. Uh, very, very complex and uh, almost like a, a language or writing. The current work that I'm doing really uses, has less emphasis on printmaking and more on uh, just using any means I can to uh, kind of transform some idea that I've got. And the ideas seem to come from uh, elements I find, uh, f you know, find around uh, that are discarded elements, objects, or I add and subtract to them. Some of the things I'm doing now that deal with taking uh, uh, prints that uh, have textures and surfaces printed on them and then cutting them up and making new kind of three-dimensional structures out of them. One of the things that's disappointing to, to art educators is, is seeing that, at least when it comes to uh, art in the schools and art as being regarded by the public, that it, that it is rather regarded as rather separate from their, their lives. And I, th I think the goal for the art educator is, is to develop this awareness uh, among their, their uh, students of this interaction between the visual between the art um, part of their world uh, and, and the social, the contextual, the environmental uh, area. And so that, so that education is not just consisting of separate uh, categories, like we have social studies here or we have art here and so on, but they uh, all are part of the same kind of uh, same world and the same kind of phenomena, only that our focus is a little different than that of, of other disciplines. I, I myself really uh, believe that one of the important things that I, I like to do, I feel very uh, reward in doing it, is, is to create uh, art. And uh, you look at art and you feel the need to keep continuing to create because it's, it's an avenue of uh, expression, it's an avenue of making things concrete that just doesn't uh, exist in any other way. If, if we were going to, uh, if we could just write about it, then we would be novelists or poets and so on. But there are certain things that only visual artists can do, and I, I think it's terribly important, and I feel very, uh, it feels very rewarding to me to, to keep working at it. This is my studio. I've got a few rooms in my studio, one with oil painting. This one is where I could just sort of sit and meander and casually work on works on paper, which I do a lot of now. Basically, I think I might say that I am, might be a, a humanist as a painter, interested in humanistic subjects or humanistic conditions of perhaps I'm a victim of or I'm a, a member of. My work has always been a kind of a schism between uh, the human condition and the intellectual approach to abstract thought. Um, where they are at this point, I'm not sure. Uh, they seem to be a little of both. It's not, it's not my intention when I do the work that I'm stimulating an audience. It's basically something I'm doing because it's stimulating me at the moment and it's, uh, it's feeding me information and ideas and, and in some ways uh, 
uh, it results into sort of a dialogue I maintain with my work. And I prefer that perhaps the audience comes to my world rather than my going to theirs, because basically, I mean, what are individuals who are artists? They're really individuals who are, you know, creating or, or responding to a particular um, idea that they perceive, and hopefully that if we're common in, in the human experience, uh, in other words, we're equal to any human being, and our experiences aren't that different from anyone else's, hopefully that that convergence comes together. There's storytelling, but there's storytelling, it's like muttering to myself about uh, things. I mean, some of the, the more recent works I'm doing have a lot to do with my history as a person, you know, experiences, my father's death, for example, uh, uh, my colleagues retiring, and you begin to realize yourself that you're not that irreplaceable. You know, you are going to be phased out eventually, too. The first time I took a, an, a concentrated uh, woodworking course was really, um, it, it turned out to be one of the few things that I've run into in my life where I got totally obsessive and was happy, sort of working 14, 16 hours a day. And it was just an area where it seemed like there was so much to learn, so many things I was interested in. And in the beginning, I was excited about learning techniques and um, the whole sort of history of furniture making and design. After a while, the techniques become less interesting and less important and sort of move on to questions about what you're making and why you're making it. And that's, what, that's the part of it that's continued to sustain my interest. I think originally I was interested in furniture. I just like the connection to function and I like the accessibility of having function be a component of the work and where the work gets its meaning. So in the beginning, I was making pretty functional objects. Now I would say the objects are more um, function-driven or have something to do with function, but they're not usually the most direct solution to any given functional problem. But they get part of their meaning from playing off of notions of function. The, the way the folding chair came about was I, um, it, something that I do fairly often, I sort of set myself a problem that comes off of, a, off of an issue. And what I wanted to do was make a very efficient production chair, which is very different from my normal way of working. I thought it would be a good thing to do. And, and what I started working with was the, the idea of a chair that folds out of a single um, square of plywood so all the parts are interlocked. And I thought I was making kind of a sculpture that was about chairs. But when I got it together, it was very close to being a, a, a chair that you could actually sit in and use. It's, um, it's call, I call it a chair, but in many ways, it's really more like a stool with a, with a gesture towards the back on it. The seat is a little bit high and a little bit short because of the geometry in order to make it work. But it, it's fine for short-term sitting has a built-in back massager on the back side. And where do these go? They go to um, a lot of people in New York with small apartments <laughs> that love the idea of having the piece hanging on the wall, getting it out of the way. Over the last 10 years, there have been three basic tracks that have emerged in my work, and um, some of the pieces synthesize them, but um, I would say that it, you could sort the pieces into three tracks. One of them is a series of projects called the Unemployment Projects, and they begin with a kind of a personal examination of what it meant for me to be out of work, and then move to a broader social examination of the structure and the system of unemployment and how it's fitted, it works culturally. Hi, I'm calling about the ad in the paper for the cashier. 
Another track in the work has been a piece, a series of what could be classified as the feminist pieces. And um, they make a very similar trajectory as the unemployment pieces in that they begin with a very personal work and move to sort of broader cultural questions. So that often is how I seem to work, is that I begin with, this is going on for me. I do a piece that looks at that. And then I move out from there. And then I say, how is this going on more generally in culture? How is this going on for other people? Our eyes met and we looked at each other. And that, that was about it. Um, but I mean, I was falling head over heels in love with the man. I mean, I, I lost 15 pounds over it, you know, I mean, I was sleepless and it just, I dreamt about him every night. And so the early uh, feminist pieces are pieces that use my own body very much in the tradition of early feminist performance art um, and examination of uh, the construction of gender by using first the presence and then eventually the absence of my body to set up the installation. The, the third track is um, the mundane, the sort of celebration of the everyday. And because the piece I'm currently involved with is do, dealing most with that, that's the track that feels closest to me. And why should you care about the world outside? For me, the only reality is my imagination, the world inside myself. The revolution no longer interests me. In Approach Avoidance, which was a uh, project that took place here in Madison and was about um, the way in which denial worked as a social force, um, the piece looked at the in imminent threats of um, AIDS, nuclear war, or environmental destruction as um, factors in our lives that we needed to close out in order to go on on a day-to-day -day basis. I knew that I would be constructing that piece in a particular community and so I, and in a particular museum space, and so I worked with um, the audience members, the people who were already on a subscription list for the museum, and the people who living in that community already had expressed some kind of interest in that project. I am suggesting that pieces, artworks, can also be the site of the experience of an instance of community that is all the members of a perhaps geographically proximate community who come to the site of a work can, in their experience of, their wor of that work, sitting at the theater for an evening have an experience of themselves as the members of a community that is catalyzed, that understanding of themselves as members of a community is catalyzed by the work and is provisional, is located at the work, is centered at the work. It's, it, the, the work becomes the point of intersection. I'm connected to you this way, I'm connected to you this way, I'm connected to you this way, and the work is then situ situ situated at that intersection and made me see those set of connections. And then it's provisional, it's transient. My, next instance of community will be with a different community of people. I think the, the major influences is, is really the environment, the place that I grew up. It really comes from, it really comes from that source. It's really about that. <laughs> I have an interest in trying to protect as much of the environment as possible. One can choose to be political about it, but I wanted to, I want to create enough interest in water through my work that others will begin to share the same beauty and the same understanding that I have of moving water. Oftentimes, it's, a lot of times it's taken for granted. And there's only so much water that exists on this earth. One of the things that has really, um, that has happened to me recently is there's, there's a certain kind of freedom that, that I have just realized. And I think it's, it's, um, you know, and five years ago it would have been called a passage, I'm sure, but uh, I don't know what you'd call it today, but it, it's the terminology today. But it's really, um, 
It's, it's the recognition of perhaps age, perhaps um, the point of the work that, I, that I'm presently involved in and the work that, that I'm about to embark on. I prefer not to know what's going to happen next, but at the same time, it's, you know, this, it's like the stream. It's like, uh, you know, the, the reference that water always seeks its own level. You never know where the, where the water is going to travel next as it, as it begins to overflow its banks or as it begins to move its channel. You never really know what's going to happen. So maybe that's a part of it. You know? Yeah, that's the best way to describe it, really. If an individual looks at my work and comes away with an interpretation and then later reflects on that interp interpretation and says, what, causes me to, what caused me to think that way? That would be about what my work is about. Right. It's about putting the individual in a, in a situation where we reflect on what we think and think carefully about it and enjoy it for what it was and understand it for what it was. Whether we come to believe that what, what we finally define as, as that thought to be as being the truth or not, that, that again is something every individual can take for themselves. I'm not after truth. As much as I find that a fascinating subject and I've been asked often about it and I've been told, ah, oh, but you do seek for truth. Not consciously I don't because I find there's just too many out there. Too many. my work and, and, and say, this is what art's about. This is what art's about. It's about that blue, it's about that brown, it's about that structure, it's about this information and all these other things that we've talked about in these kind of like huge democratic principles about the freedom of how you want to interpret. Those are some of the things that are still interesting. But bottom line, the context for this is all within the context of art. There isn't any, I'm borrowing from 19th century, I'm borrowing from 1960s. Um, borrowing, borrowing, I'm, you know, nothing is created in a vacuum, really, unless you're a quantum physicist, I guess, which they have a different argument about that. But um, that's, that's basically what I do. I'm having fun. I'm having fun. I make art. It's like when I played that guitar, when I played my bass, when I played jazz. I was restricted to, all, to everything that was musical. Sure, I could be cagey and start pounding on the wall or open a window while I'm playing the bass and count that as a part of art. But we're still talking about art. We're still talking about that medium that I'm working in. But, you know, th this, this could very easily sound very, very wishy-washy and very, very like, oh, I mean, just, dude, it's like I can look at the spot on the wall and we can talk about the same thing. With one exception, with one exception, context. The artist provides context. Within the context, that language will either grow or it will diminish. I think therein lies the true value of an artist who's really, really effective. I'm not going to say an artist that's good, bad, or otherwise, but effective. I think the artist that provides the context within which we can come to understand, understand ourselves in ways where we can grow and keep growing, that's about as far, I think, as we can go with it. <laughs>